the question, who am I? I thought, I heard this question before. I knew that it was inscribed on the Apollo, the Apollo temple in Delphi, but I didn't understand what it meant. Who am I? I am Edward Frankel. I am a, you know, Berkeley professor. It's a dangerous question. It's a very dangerous question when you actually engage with it, for real. Yeah, it's a terrifying question. And we can't do it on our own, I think. It ultimately has to be some, somebody in your life. So it could be a therapist, for instance. In my case, I was lucky. There was some human being who just came into my world who was a, a wise woman, let's just say, a wise woman, and somebody I respected. Who, And this is about a year after the book came out. So this is summer of 2014. The book was published in October 2013. So I was ready to, to go beyond to, from Edward 1.0 to... <laughs> <laughs> you have to be ready for it and some sense. And and then the the universe quote unquote will conspire. At least that's how, what happened to me. And I have since heard stories, similar stories from other people. So what happened was that she basically so we started talking about life and so on. And I was very curious about reality. What is reality? Because I was obsessed with the idea that where mathematics comes from. It was very clear to me it doesn't come from human minds, specific human minds. Like Pythagoras did not create Pythagoras theorem, you know, mm. or Evaris Galois did not create Gala groups. They were there for him to discover. But then what does it mean? What is reality then? What is it at the base of reality? And in fact, if you look, and, and the title of my book is Love and Math, and the subtitle is The Heart of Hidden Reality. So it's kind of like my search for hidden reality was happening, even if I was not fully aware of what I'm doing, even when I was writing it. And then the, the crucial thing that she told me, she said, yes, Edward, there is hidden reality, quote unquote, but it's not outside. You think it, you find it somewhere. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's within you. You have to learn more about yourself. And so, and I, it's like, what does it mean? So then she told me some stories of what it means, you know, what it meant in her case, that she was able to reconnect to some childhood experiences that she had when she was an adult already. And that completely changed her, changed her view, her outlook. And suddenly things start happening. I start remembering things that happened as a child. In particular, the experience that I described in the book, in chapter three, about my exam when I was 16 years old and I was not accept- was not, uh, was failed at the, uh, ruthlessly at the exam at Moscow University. I thought I knew, I remembered it. I remembered it factually. I remembered it as a third person, from a third person perspective. But I did not remember it from the first person. And so then suddenly there is this happened in uh, September of 2014, where I was asked to speak about it. And the night before at my hotel, I was able to connect with that boy. And it was like a tsunami. I, I realized what happened. And, and what, uh, Did you break down crying? Oh, of course. But it was, it was worse because in some sense it was worse because the thought that I had in my mind was no amount of tears justify this world, justify this life. Why? What is the point? Oh, geez. It's really, really mm-hmm. kind of sad moment because you realize a part of you died. I realized part of me died when I was 16 years old and I was not even aware of it for 30 years. Okay. So I am moving on the battlefield of life, crippled basically, like I'm missing a limb and I'm not even aware of it. And my mind, my conscious mind, of course, don't look there. Don't look there. Don't look there. That's why I was coming up with all of these ideas about the universe and reality the objective reality and so on, because how convenient. It's all deterministic. I, and uh, it's all a bag of particles. So particles don't feel pain or a human is an algorithm. So it's a coping mechanism. Coping mechanism. For me, for me, it definitely was. And I will never say that it's true for everybody. Maybe it is for some people. Maybe it's not. All I'm doing, I'm sharing my story. This is my story. I am convinced that some of the naive and, and vapid quite frankly, ideas that I entertained about the, the world were to a large extent motivated by me not willing to find out what happened to me when I was 16 years old mm-hmm. because it was too painful. Because it was too painful. I wrote a piece about this, by the way. I was asked to... Uh, I've spoken about this a number of times, including my last conversation with Lex Friedman. But... Uh, I also wrote a short piece for the, for a volume by um, um, my, my 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 friend who is an expert, uh, Jim Polsky, who is a friend who is a, an expert on AI safety. So he published a volume. I'll link it in volume. the description. 
yeah, academic volume on um, AI safety and security. And he asked me to contribute about first person perspective. So I wrote about this and to what extent this um, defined me, you know, um, not knowing, not knowing. Because then your life becomes driven to a large extent by creating barriers of finding out. And that's what it means, who you are, who am I, right? So I understood what it means. If I, if there is this part of me, which I chopped off, why? Because it was too painful. So it is a defense mechanism. And nothing wrong with it. We all happens to all of us, I believe, to some extent. And there is a lot of literature about this, by the way, and, and neuroscience uh, confirmations and so on. So, but it's me, it's part of me, and yet I'm no longer connected to it. So do I know who I am? No, because there is this part of me which I'm not connected to. So that's one way in which you can, um, it becomes a very practical question. Who am I? Is, do, am, am I aware of all my secret mm -hmm. little adverts? And not yeah. necessarily, it could happen in adolescence and in adult life. But most traumatic experience, most difficult experiences usually happen when we're children. We're not yet equipped to deal with this pain. And for me, it definitely it defined my life. It gave me a lot of fuel, but propelled me to become a mathematician and so to achieve and so on. To prove those guys who failed me that uh -huh. how good I am. You see, so five years after I failed at 16, I get a letter from the president of Harvard University inviting me to visit, come to Harvard as a visiting professor. I'm barely 21 because I wrote some papers which became famous or well known, you know? Why? Because the drive, you know, the drive. But then the cost of it, the downside of it, is that my, I'm not, I lose that spontaneity, spontaneity of, of a child, that ability to look at the world with fresh eyes. I'm afraid of things. I'm scared. I want control. I want safety. Do you feel like that was a cost that if you were able to rewind time, you wouldn't pay? Because another perspective is, you know what, Edward? Everything that happened to you made you. Yeah, well, I, I did it myself, of course. Of course. I would not change a thing. But I can say it only now because I have connected to that child. I connect to some other painful experiences that I can say it. If somebody came to me before it happened and told me that, Edward, you should be grateful to your examiners who failed you. Because that's what gave, made you who you are. I would just hit them in the face. Like, what are you talking about? How dare you? But now, of course, I know. Yes, of course. I would not change a thing. It was all me all along. And yeah. I'm, I am not, uh, no qualms about it. I would not have been who I am without any of those experiences. Unless I still refuse to connect to them. If I'm still refusing, then I'm not myself fully. You see what I mean? And so you ask, how did I get interested in the subject? So then, this is 2014. Then I started getting invited to various forums to speak about this thing. And that's when, that was the first wave when AI became controversial. This is, <clears throat> mind you, nine years ago. But already you had people like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk and Bill Gates already voiced concerns. And so this becomes my playground, this conversation, because I think up until that point, I am in sort of this half asleep state where I am still, I'm still thinking partially about myself as a kind of a machine, or I would like to be a machine because the machine doesn't feel pain. So, you know, kind of feel safe. Also, I feel that I know how things work. Again, feel makes me feel in control, you know. Suddenly, I all of that is swept away. My child, my inner child, you know, unfortunately, such becomes such a shrub. Um, yeah, I don't want to use this expression, but um, but it's true. It's like you know, again this dimension, this dimension of a uh, you know Jung talked about this this archetype of divine child. That's the part of you which always wants to grow, which wants to look at the world in a fresh with the fresh eyes, which is spontaneous, which is spontaneous, which is playful. I, I lost it to a large extent because my real, my connection to a very specific child, 16 year old Edward was severe. 
Ah. Uh, severed, uh, you know, at that okay. exam. And suddenly I'm connected. So that now I am like, wow, you know. So now I am going the opposite extreme. And I'm saying, you know, this. So then for me, AI becomes this ideas of AI, the ideas of uploading like that singularity and uploading your mind and so on. It becomes totally opposite to what I'm experiencing, right? It's, it, it almost about, becomes the idea of me being captured by this, but again, by the by my cerebral side. Because ultimately for me, this discussion about AI, it, it's just a safe way to talk about ourselves. AI represents our, our um, cerebral logical side. Like in the movie, uh, the 2001 Space Odyssey by, by, by the great Stanley Kubrick, HAL 9000. What is HAL 9000? He is the the cerebral part of Dave Bowman, the astronaut, which has run amok. I don't know if you're familiar mm. with this movie. Yes, 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 yes. So that becomes the motivation for this, for this, for this interest. You see, and so ultimately, I understand also that we need to find balance because, of course, this is this are amazing technological innovations, and there's nothing wrong with them as long as we f- put, phrase the phrase our inquiry our questions properly not as a question of as already Alan Tunis said it's not a good way are they thinking are they conscious are they intelligent the question is to what extent they help they are here to facilitate to help me to be as good an Edward as I can be mm-hmm. it's like it's like artists in the end of 19th the end of 19th beginning of 20th century after photography was discovered so suddenly you don't need to be, being an artist is not about rendering things realistically because if a, a, a camera can do it better than you. So what do you do? Did artists say it's over for us? We, we become the captives, the, the slaves of the, of the photo camera. No, they discover other ways to express themselves. That's how you get impressionism, abstract art. Cubism, you know, surrealism, and so on, where the focus is more on the ex- inner experience of the viewer and the artist. You see, they accepted the challenge and it propelled them to the next level. And likewise, for us, I think it's very clear that Chat GPT is showing us that some of the things that perhaps we thought it w- w- were creative, they're not that. They're not that creative. A the, the, the pro- computer program, which is basically trained on just correlations of things in various texts throughout the internet can actually reproduce it and maybe do a better job than you do. So I take it as a challenge. What am I bringing to the table if this computer program can replace these things? So what, what, can, I, what can I do that it cannot do? Yes, yes. You see? Yeah, so there's something called the moving of the goalpost fallacy, which I don't see as always a fallacy. So for instance, you just mentioned, we thought that creativity was the ability to draw accurately, let's say in the early 90s. That's right. Then we realized, okay, something else can do that. So we changed what creative means. But it's not because, in the one sense, you can say we've moved the goalpost, but it's not a fallacy because our original definition reflects our ignorance. We realize something. Exactly, because we can grow. That's the whole point. Everybody, especially, I love it when it comes from people who are actually completely sold on evolution. They say it's, only, it's the only force in, in, in development of, say, human beings or other species. You may agree or disagree with it. And some people say that maybe there are some other things that have to be taken account. I'm not going to make a, ju- a judgment, but I'm just curious. What do you think evolution is for human beings? If it's not, this is a very good example. How we can evolve is because mm-hmm. we are challenged by the technology that we ourselves create. Now, this is a very different framework, a very different mindset than the mindset of the sort of end of the world and how these things are going to capture us and kill us and so on. It's not productive, obviously. But this challenge, take it as a challenge. Take how you respond to it. You know, I think it's very productive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And a lot of people are, I'm not saying something original. I have heard a lot of people say that. It's just that not, it's not necessarily represented in the debate that you could see in the media. Uh, because usually it's computer scientists who are being questioned. And let me tell you, if somebody asked me 10 years ago, before I had my, um, how to say, because before I started to ask the question, who am I? Well, I would give you an answer. I would have given you an answer. Yeah. Very, very confidently. Yes, very confidently. Yes. 
you know? <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah. the one. That's the thing. And maybe that's another sign that you shouldn't trust someone is how assertive and how little self-doubt do they show. I, I, I want to be personal, if you don't mind, and reveal mm. something to you. Maybe this will go and maybe it won't. When you mentioned, look, you had some childhood issues. I've always heard this like childhood issues, childhood issues. And I've explored my childhood. I can't find issues. But then I realized, okay, well, you said 16. So I think I had, well, when I was 17, I had my heart so broken. Like, I don't think it's been broken as much since, like, ever. And, mm. and, and man, with this podcast, Edward, like, almost with everything I do, I struggle, like, so hard. I struggle, 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 struggle. I push. And this, there's this ambition competitiveness and if there's a desire in me it has to be the best it has to be undeniably the best like when i interview someone it has to be that someone could watch all the interviews of that person say this toe theories of everything was the deepest with this person and luckily luckily often i'll get the interviewees saying something like like this this, these were insightful questions i've never been asked this or or whatever okay so i get some validation or from the commenters but but so i'd often think you know what i don't have childhood issues i have adult issues meaning that like i have a this distinct feeling that 10 years from now i'll look at myself now and want to hug him like just say mm. hey man like you i'm i'm sorry like i'm broken now but i also think that much of that comes from crippling feelings of self doubt and inadequacy from when i was 17 sure Sure, that exactly right, exactly right. And then the thing is, in what you say, is I, I resonate completely. But one thing, one has to be very careful of saying uh, there was no issue or whatever. It, it's our thinking mind who says that. Our thinking mind is very limited. So Jung, the, one of the main um, ideas that he brought sort of out and became um, um, part of our collective discourse is the idea of unconscious. Freud talked about subconscious, I, I prefer unconscious. So this idea that there are some realms of the psyche which are not accessible to the thinking mind yet. And it's very important to accept that, I think, because then it's not anymore that the, the thinking mind is the final arbiter of what did or did not happen. In my case, if you asked me in 2014, before I had my sort of experience of reconnection, are you connected to that boy that was suffered in in mm-hmm. 1984 in, in this exam i would say yes of course because i remember every fact of it and in fact i wrote it uh, i wrote the story in my book which was published a year before and interesting enough a lot of people were were inspired by it and they, a lot of people came wrote to me or talked to me about it but they were touched by it and i was surprised because i was not yet touched by it but mm-hmm. because i that's the power of art because i wanted to write a book and to connect to my readers, I allowed the boy to speak. I was not yet ready to speak to the boy, me, adult Edward, in 2013 or 2012. But because I wanted to book the book to be real, I delegated this chapter to him, and it was the first time that he was unfiltered. He spoke, not to me yet. He spoke to the readers of the book, but the ice was broken. So mm. barely a year later, I finally found the courage and the strength to speak to him directly and to understand, to remember what happened. So my thinking mind was not aware of it. It's very important to understand and it's, you cannot force it. It's very important not to force because if you're not ready for it, I could commit suicide easily, easily. I could see that easily because you're so disenchanted. You're so disappointed in this, in this cruel, cruel world. You feel like there is no reason to live and you have to be very strong to to withstand that. And in fact, the point is that it, it passes. It, it passed. And I, and I had this amazing experience of like, he comes alive. He's within me. Like I hold him. He's here. And I, and I, and I spoke to him, to the little Edward. And I said, look, you know, I'm sorry. I have neglected you for 30 years. I did not know. But look what we have done. Look what we have done. It was not in vain. It was not in vain. And now you're back and I will never let anybody hurt you. 